All right, joining me once again is friend of the channel, Commander Brian McGrath, U.S. and retired ship driver extraordinaire, who commanded an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, which will be relevant to this conversation. Brian runs a substack that we've mentioned before called the Conservative Wahoo. Brian, let me start with breaking news, which is, and this isn't an incredible surprise, we could have presaged this was going to be the case, but the Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group has been extended. They went on cruise early November, so let's do the math, December, January, February, March, April, May. So now I guess they're just giving them an early heads up that you're not going home in the May-June timeframe as you may have thought. But this is kind of becoming the new normal, right? I mean, this is what happened to Ford, Truman, Bush. Now it seems like seven months are the shortest ones and the standard is like nine plus months. So that's the first part of what we're talking about here. But we want to focus on the defense budget and the fiscal year 25 budget was just released. Here's the news, the top line, let's say, on this fiscal year 25. So first off, they built this under the restrictions of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which I'm not quite sure what that is, except it limits the Biden administration's spending on national defense to $895 billion, which seems like a lot, but it's not, and we'll explain why. So is this a Biden administration restraint on itself? No. Um, this The Fiscal Responsibility Act is a legacy of the debt ceiling agreement that Speaker McCarthy forged with the administration two, almost two summers ago, I think, that uh, limited the last defense budget to a 3% growth and this defense budget to a 1% growth. I'd like to hope that um, it was hard for them to do it, that, uh, but I think given their other desires with what they wish to do with um, the people's money, um, a way, an external way to uh, constrain defense spending was is helpful for them. To go deeper into the numbers here, specifically the Navy slash Marine Corps numbers, with the fiscal year 25 request, Navy's asking for a total of 257.6 billion with 203.9 billion for the Navy and 53.7 billion for the Marine Corps. And as you suggest, that's just under 1% increase over last year. The Navy's portion of the budget breaks down to 70.2 billion in operations and maintenance funding, 63.3 billion in procurement, 43.8 billion for military personnel, 22.7 billion in research and development funding, and 3.9 billion for military construction. So your latest substack starts with Admiral Aquilino, who is the COCOM in the Far East, Indo-PACOM is the abbreviation for that combatant command. Basically, he's the guy worried about China. And his latest testimony on the Hill a few weeks ago gave a little bit of new information. So talk to us about what he testified. The most important takeaway from it was his assessment that President Xi's direction to the armed forces to be ready, organized, trained, and equipped to reunify China, i.e. I to make an attack on Taiwan, by 2027, I think, is the current uh, year, uh, that they are on track for that. His assessment is that they are on track for that. He's not saying that the Chinese are going to invade Taiwan in 27 or 26 or 25. What he's saying is that he believes that their military industrial complex and their training complex and all of the things that go into being ready to do what it is Chairman Xi suggested he wanted them to be able to do, that that is all on track. And this is as manifest in their shipbuilding, in their manning, in their exercises, 
in the South China Sea. Yes, 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 yes. Well, we'll also note that the Chinese, Iranians, and Russians a few weeks ago did, for the second year in a row, by the way, an exercise in the Persian Gulf. I forget what name they gave it, but that's sort of an axis of evil X-24, um, which is noteworthy that those guys are cooperating in a way that maybe we don't think about. I wrote an article with uh, uh, Mackenzie Eaglin in 2012, where we where we suggested that we that Russia and China would team up. We get kind of laughed at by the some of the national security or so the international security crowd. I, I am convinced that that is uh, a nexus of cooperation that we are going to be dealing with for years to come. So China equals the threat, and as we know from our time in the Navy pre 9-11, the pacing threat was the Soviet Union and the existence of that threat informed large defense budgets. Similarly now, the Senate could say that this fear mongering about China is a function of trying to keep the defense budgets up. Be that as it may, the fact is if you look at what's happening globally and how our Navy is committed currently, it's inarguable that we have to have presence in hot spots, even short of a full up peer conflict. And this is evident in and around the Middle East, particularly the waters of the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. You talk about the trade-off. This is where the title walk and chew gum comes from. So tell us about what you mean with that. The Navy, our Navy, has to do two things, right? It has to be ready and, and dispersed around the world to operate and protect our interests in our economy. And it has to be ready to fight war. Those two functions, those two grand functions have components to them. One is a, is a readiness, of, uh, is a current readiness component. Do we have enough people? Do we have enough fuel? Do we have enough parts? Do we have enough training? Do we have enough ships? Are they out there? Are they where they're supposed to be? Are they networked? All of those things play into that. And that's sort of broadly considered current readiness. The problem is that current readiness and current technology never stays current. And that a Navy has to be able to change over time to adapt to the security environment it is presented with which means it must constantly be investing in itself. It has, to, it has to have new capabilities. It has to have new platforms. It has to have new weapons. What I think we're doing right now at a level that I find dangerous and I find unsafe is that we are concentrating uh, almost to a fault on the current environment, the current fight, this current readiness problem. And deferring, I, I refer to it as eating the seed corn. We're deferring the design and construction of our next destroyer. We're deferring the design and construction of our next uh, attack submarine. We are deferring the design and construction of our uh, next generation air dominance uh, uh, fighter attack system. We are deferring the design and construction of that which will replace uh, literally hundreds of helicopters across the Navy, and we are deferring the uh, purchase of our uh, next aircraft carrier, pushing them all out of the budget because of a current readiness mania. That current readiness, readiness mania isn't just generated by the Navy. It's coming from the National Security Council. It's coming from the president. It's coming from the S Secretary of Defense, which, which is, hey, you all have to put your modernization plans on hold so that we can put uh, we can put a team out on the field that will deter China f from uh, what we think is its plans or what might be its plans in the next few years. So you write in the Substack that this actually started a, a couple of years ago. Let me read uh, this excerpt. In a memo dated June 4, 2021, Acting Navy Secretary Thomas Harker, I don't remember that guy. There must have been a lot of changes of the guard in those in those times. He was the only guy held over from the previous administration, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I got to be honest, I don't remember him. 
Uh, so Secretary Harker called on the Navy to choose one of three programs to initially pursue in earnest in the program objective memorandum 2023 budget cycle. That's what you will hear people call POM. POM 23 budget cycle. And he quotes, the Navy cannot afford to simultaneously develop the next generation of air service and subsurface platforms and must prioritize these programs balancing the cost of developing next generation capabilities against maintaining current capabilities. As part of the POM 23 budget, the Navy should prioritize one of the following capabilities and rephase the other two after an assessment of operational, financial, and technical risk. End quote. So you put a finer point on it here. You say this is what managing great power, which you call not competition, but contention, looks like. We cannot afford to move forward with future ship, future submarine, and future jet all at the same time. We'll continue to build present versions of those things in insufficient number. And then you say it gets worse. What it gets worse in is we haven't even picked one of those three things. In fact, uh, at the time when Harker put that memo out, I remember reading it and thinking, this is managed decline. <laughs> and now I look at the 2025 budget and all three of those programs are now being deferred. Um, and, it's, and, and these are choices. And as I put in the article, if I were wearing Admiral Stars right now or was a senior civilian in the uh, Department of the Navy, and I was charged with carrying out the current national defense strategy, uh, I cannot imagine doing anything but what they're doing right now, which is to fund current readiness and push off modernization of those platforms. Except that my problem is that I think that strategy is short-sighted. That calculus you just went through, you can't defer current demand signal. You can't ignore shipping lanes. You can't ignore post-October 7th conflict in and around Israel. Um, and the other hotspots, if Iran keeps harassing shipping in the Gulf and the, the Straits, then we're going to have to do something about it, right? You can't wait. I mean, you can't say, okay, we'll, we'll put that in the out years. We'll worry about that two years hence so we can fund NGAD, you know, that's just not, the calculus is self-evident. Um, and as you say, ultimately this boils down to money and it boils down to will. Those are kind of synonymous. We're not spending enough on the Navy to ensure we have a Navy that can do what we wanted to do, not so much now, but in the future. So Eisenhower on station, Remind me when that ship was commissioned. 32, 30, 30 years ago, I would think. I think you're right. I cruised on Eisenhower in 91, 92 time frame. Um, and she wasn't a new ship at that point. Um, so a choice was made 32 plus years ago. That choice was probably 40 years ago. The, the, the decision to put money to build that ship is 40 years old. Now, let me talk about the budget here specifically, and we're talking about 2025 is the budget that just dropped. So, and we're talking fiscal year. So that means it goes from October to October, not calendar year. So fiscal year 25 starts in, and make sure I'm right here. Fiscal year 25 starts in October of 24. So here's the sort of high level overview courtesy of our friends at USNI News, they want to buy six Battle Force ships and decommission 19 ships. This is readiness over modernization, as you've said. That's how it's summarized. Smaller shipbuilding request. Specifically, last year they asked for two Virginia-class submarines. This year they only want one, which is noteworthy. Two Arleigh Burke class destroyers, one Constellation class frigate, one San Antonio class amphibious transport dock, and one medium landing ship. Those are the new builds in 25. Building six, decommissioning 19. That's going the wrong way in terms of you don't grow a fleet by decommissioning more ships than you build. Since this is an aviation channel, by and large, let's talk about the airplanes that this request wants to buy. 
So it earmarks $16.2 billion to buy a total of 75 aircraft. That's $900 million less than last year's request. It's nine F-35Cs. Those are the carrier-based F-35s. 13 F-35Bs for the Marine Corps. Reminder, something we pointed out that because of the deficit in getting those to the fleet, Bataan had Harriers aboard. And I know a lot of people were like, I thought we got rid of the Harrier. Well, we can't because we don't have enough F-35Bs. So this request wants 13 F-35Bs. And there's 15 multi-engine training systems for the Navy, 12 multi-engine training systems for the Marine Corps, 19 of the CH-53K King Stallion heavy lift helicopter for the Marine Corps, and three MQ-25A Stingrays for the Navy's carrier air wing, which is the unmanned refueling platform that is coming online. As you mentioned, they're continuing development of FAXX, which the Air Force calls Next Generation Air Dominance, NGAD. However, last year's request was $1.5 billion. This year's request is less than a third of that, $454 million. So like you said, we're, we're, let's just use the word punting on Next Generation stuff across all warfare specialties. The other thing, as we talk about what's actually going on, because what frustrates me more than talking about pure conflict or the high-end fight, which is sort of a a theoretical at some level, and as we said previous, that's a demand signal that's created. I don't want to be too cynical about it, but a demand signal is created to inform a budget um, and keep production lines moving and so forth and so on. But if you look at what what is really going on in the Red Sea, particularly, there are a lot of standard missiles being used. There are a lot of AMRAMs being fired. And that capability is not theoretical. It's actually a operational reality. So this budget talks about buying 125 SM6s, 22 tactical Tomahawks and 102 naval strike missiles for both the Navy and Marine Corps, 30 Lorazms, which is the long range air to surface missile, 261 AMRAMs, which the Super Hornet uses, it's the active missile, and then 60 Lorazm extended ranges. I was trying to do the math in my mind of some of the war games I played of, of how many hours worth of missiles that is with a high end in a high end fight. I, I, my guess is it was probably less than 36 hours worth of missiles. The request does not ask to buy any conventional prompt strike weapons. That's acronym CPS. CPS is a hypersonic missile that the Navy planned to field on the Zumwalt class guided missile destroyer in fiscal year 25 and the Virginia class attack submarine in 28. But the plans to field a weapon on the Zumwalt class destroyers are delayed another year. So we're deferring future capability for current readiness. Unmanned, there's $54 million, relatively small amount in research and development for the large unmanned surface vessel and 21 million in R&D funding for the extra large unmanned undersea vehicle. That's a pretty substantial decrease from the previous year. Again, that's future capability that I know the TICOMs are very interested, particularly Surf Pack is very interested in unmanned. He's also interested in directed energy weapons, and that is lagging as well. And, and uh, I'm going to actually talk to Admiral McLean at the end of this month out in San Diego, and that'll be part of that discussion. So look for that episode in a few weeks. Finally, here, the Marine Corps request is $17.4 billion in O&M funding, operations and maintenance, 13.8 in procurement, 18 billion in personnel, 3 billion in research and development, and 1.4 billion in military construction. That's all kind of tied up in a few platforms. They want 80 amphibious combat vehicles. They want 674 joint light tactical vehicles. 123 anti-armor missile javelins, eight long-range fires, and 12 medium-range interceptor-capable launchers and missiles. And then all of their 
future stuff, those lines are zeroed out. They're not even including that in the request. So again, future capability, um, not in there. So I just review that because this is the actual manifestation of your thesis. This, again, this isn't theoretical. This is actually how it's breaking down. We are carrying around a bucket with a hole in the bottom. That's, uh, you know, Lurie, Erlaine Lurie is, you can't decommission your way to growth um, uh, in action. And, and, uh, and, and right now, I think what I'm seeing, uh, the most charitable explanation is they want to patch that hole. And patching that hole means cashing in the future for a certain amount of time of some sort of a pause. The problem I have is that um, I don't know how they know when that pause ends. If, uh, if President Xi decides not to invade Taiwan between now and 2027 and on January 1st, 2028, is it, hey, hey, let's go buy stuff now. Let's get, you know, I don't know what the logic is. The logic that appeals to me is we must prepare for the near term possibility of near term conflict. We must get our production lines spinning, multiple shifts, more money, more money. We have to do that. At the same time, we have to put real money against a future fighter, a future submarine, a future destroyer, a future maritime strike platform, and a future aircraft carrier. The thing about the aircraft carrier that really bothers me is you look in the plans, you look in the theory of your shipbuilding plan, um, we are on our way to a nine carrier force. We're pushing aircraft carriers to the right. And, uh, you know, when you, when you build a carrier in a, in a, uh, you know, every four or every five years, you can then, um, have a fleet of 11 or 12 aircraft carriers for as long as the eyes can see. You can have those carriers. You can take one out of commission for three years and refuel it like you have to do with those uh, aircraft carriers at the middle of their lives. You can do that. But what we're doing by spreading out the carrier build cycle, not only are we doing potentially long-term damage to the industrial base and the labor force, um, we are limiting ourselves to the number of carriers we'll have to be able to do the things carriers do in the future. If 40 years ago, defense policymakers were as short-sighted as they are right now, we might not have the Eisenhower to be extended in the Red Sea. But because those, those people made good decisions, made good force structure decisions, understood the value of naval forward presence, understood the, the flexibility and lethality of carrier air power. They did what they needed to do. That's not happening now. That, that investing for the future is not happening. So remind everybody of something that we pointed out during my conversation with Admiral Verissimo, which is by the numbers, to your point. We have 11 aircraft carriers now. So let's just look at the East Coast. When I was on Ford with Admiral Verissimo, Washington and Truman were on the pier or on other piers down from us. So three pier side, three across the river, including one in the major overhaul, the RCOH, getting record. One of seven that is underway, and that's Ike, right? Now, if we truly want to deter Iran from joining this proxy war that's going on around the Arabian Peninsula and Israel, and yesterday's events where Israel reportedly, they uh, deny it or they haven't acknowledged it, uh, struck an Iranian consulate in Damascus, not sure what the motivation there would be, except they're going, that's where the Quds Force headquarters is. It has nothing to do with being an embassy. We're just trying to take out bad actors. But in so doing, it's a direct attack for the first time since October 7th on sovereign Iranian property, let's just say. You know, an embassy is, is part of the country. So that is an escalation by any stretch. 
Okay. So what is it that we can do to deter Iran from, let's just say, taking the bait? Well, if we had an aircraft carrier in the Gulf proper, that's a good start. Good luck getting wheels in the well as you launch out a bond or a boss or whatever. That's a huge deterrent. Right now, we have one in the Red Sea, none in the Persian Gulf, none in the Eastern Met. So just being able to do the job, this isn't like a stretch goal. This isn't uh, nice to have. This is the basics of what the expeditionary part of the U.S. military does, fighting them over there so we don't have to fight them here to use Bush administration sort of logic. And so this 25 budget is insufficient with respect to that requirement. You think about how much heavy lifting those four Arleigh Burke guided missile destroyers are doing currently in the Gulf of Aden, Bab el-Mandeb, and Red Sea. It's been going on in earnest. In fact, Carney, as Admiral McClain, as, as Admiral McClain pointed out in his comments at the Surface Navy Association convention back in January, Carney, and he was CEO Carney, um, as he pointed out, Carney is the poster child, that's not the word he used, but from going from workups where they didn't train necessarily to the specific Houthi execution of ballistic missiles and drones, but when they in chopped, like within 48 hours, they were shooting down ballistic Quds missiles headed for Israel, and then they, you know, had these fusilades going back and forth, missile exchanges with them on a daily basis. Driving around Opcon 3 all the time, all those ships, no ports. Those guys are being run hard, which is a segue to the concern about not just recruiting. It's well documented how the military has had trouble with their recruiting targets. But retention, as you and I know, the reason that Secretary Lehman mandated an op tempo pers tempo situation of basically two months at home for every one month underway and then manifest that in law is because he saw what it was doing at a time when airlines were hiring and other, there were other options, the economy was good, to retention. And you had certain year groups, both officer and enlisted, that you had this bathtub as you looked across five years of year groups. And so when it got time to man a ship or a ready room, and suddenly you don't have a flight deck chief, and you don't have any division leads who are lieutenant commanders, and so forth and so on, you're like, oh, maybe we should have cared about this like three to five years ago. So I guarantee you, we can talk about sailor resilience and we can talk about a bunch of stuff. But when you put folks to sea for 10 months at a time, that's going to have a corrosive effect on both recruiting and retention. What is it? Mike Tyson's famous line that everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, the world has punched this administration in the face. I don't, I'm not trying to, I'm not going at this from a political standpoint. I'm trying to say what the facts are. This administration want, came in and wanted to control defense spending because it is, that, that because they believed that there was money available that it could apply to other priorities. That's what elections are for. And that's, I'm okay with that. That's what they do. The problem is they got punched in the face. Um, and that punching is continuing, right? The, the Russians invaded Ukraine. Um, the Hamas uh, committed a terrorist attack against Israel. And uh, China continues to uh, continues with its bad behavior. Um, this administration wanted to come in and cut back on naval forward presence. They believed that we were chewing up readiness, important readiness of the force 
just cutting holes in the ocean, doing stuff that wasn't important out there forward. And that we were forward only because the admirals wanted to be forward and because Navy people like to be forward, um, that there really wasn't that much of a justification. And oh, by the way, if we lean heavily on the whole of government to deter rather than just that sort of military option, we can have integrated deterrence and integrated deterrence will allow us to cut back on that forward presence and we can then have a smaller Navy. This is what they came in. This was their theory of action when they came in. A, a, a theory that could have worked if the world had remained safe and sanguine, but it didn't. And now they are doing the same stuff that every administration does, and that is it goes to the well, and they're going to the well, they're extending an aircraft carrier, the ships are out there. Uh, I don't know when this all ends. I don't know how it all ends. I don't know how we get back to some sense of normal operating uh, tempo. Um, but the bottom line is, is we, we have... We have interests in three areas of the world, generally speaking. Mediterranean Europe, the Middle East, and the Indo-Pacific. We need to have naval force present and lethal in all three of those places all the time. That's what I call the three-hub navy. It's not my original, but that's what people like me call the three-hub navy. We never got to a point where we properly resourced the two-hub Navy. We are attempting to cover down on three areas of the world with a Navy that was built to cover two and never got to the size it needed to properly cover two. We are just, we're just eating the seed corn. There's a hole in the bottom of the bucket and I don't know how, I don't know how it, I don't know how things get better without a significant increase in spending. It sure doesn't get better without presence and forward presence. And we've outlined here uh, what that's, what that's going to take and where we're deficit. So Commander Brian McGrath, thank you very much for joining us once again. Again, Brian's substack is Conservative Wahoo. I will put the subscription link in the episode description each and every week. He has good stuff, both Navy, Pentagon-focused stuff, and also sort of life stuff. And Brian, let me say publicly, uh, you did a, a, a substack a couple of weeks ago about your dog, Baloo, that went over the Rainbow Bridge, and it, it actually made me cry. Um, and so uh, sympathies uh, to you for, for that. That's always, always hard. We have a little guy who's uh, approaching the foot of the rainbow bridge right these days. And um, so uh, hearts go out to you guys at stately McGrath Manor over there uh, for that. And you, you just, the way you phrased it and, and framed it, it, it just really made it evident how he was a part of the family. So um, yes, he was. Um, uh, again, sorry for that, but we look forward to having you on the channel again very soon. I really enjoy this work. Thank you. All right. That'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything going forward. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.